there are or herbs, uh, turmeric, you know, that is in curry in India. You know, it's uh, people in India eat an average of a gram of turmeric every day in their in their curries, and it has been associated with a very low rate of cancer and Alzheimer's disease in India, despite the fact that they've got overcrowding, a lot of pollution, and all kinds of other problems. So that's that's one nice herb. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Reshape Your Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Morgan Nolte, and today I get to interview Dr. Bill Rawls. He's dedicated his life to medicine. He's a fourth generation physician and has practiced for over 30 years. Now he has a really interesting story story because in his mid forties, he was faced with a, a health crisis and the traditional medical model, which he was trained in and practice in was not helping him. So he had to look outside of traditional medicine and into some alternative treatments. That's where he really, um, uncovered and harness the power of herbs and phytochemicals. And that's really how I got to know him through his book, the cellular wellness solution. He's also written another best-selling book, unlocking Lyme. He's the medical director and co-founder of vital plan Inc, which is a holistic health company. And the focus of today's interview is going to be about phytochemicals and how they're different from micronutrients. And we're going to talk about the benefits of herbs. And then the specific focus focus that we want to take today is on detoxing and liver health, because one day during office hours, our Zibli members asked for more content on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So I thought that Dr. Rawls would be a really good resource to talk about true detoxing and why it starts in the cells, not the liver, um, and how we can best support the liver to prevent and reverse non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So Dr. Rawls, thank you so much for joining the podcast today. I'm excited for this conversation. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. And I did read your book. So over the last week, I've been kind of devouring the cellular wellness solution. And I do have to say, I think it's going to be, I know it's going to be my go-to resource for supplements. I get that question so often on supplements for bone health or menopause or sleep or all these different things, blood sugar regulation. And so thank you, first of all, because I, I've never written a book, but I've interviewed a lot of authors and I know it's such a labor of love. Um, and first off, thank you for this excellent resource. Uh, absolutely. It, it's, uh, this one was a three year effort. It took a lot of information, a lot of time to research everything, and then to boil it down to something that was consumable and easy to read. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. So let's get started. It's in the book a little bit, but will you just start with your own journey and how you got into this space of a more holistic approach and out of that traditional medicine that you were practicing? Yeah. You know, it, it's, um, I came to this through family, um, you know, that I, I knew medicine, um, ended up going to medical school. Um, and in medicine, I was attracted to the field of OBGYN because it dealt with wellness, bringing life into the world, um, and wasn't quite so medical pharmaceutical heavy. Um, but that came with a price and I wanted to get the best education that I could and practice in a small town along the coast, which I did, but that was a, uh, a meant that I was on call every second to third night. And so I was basically sleep deprived for 15 or 20 years out of my life, stressed, you know, trying to do community, family, and balance this just crazy job that I was on call 24 to 36 hours every second or third night. And I was one of those people that if I had people in the hospital or a patient in labor, I just didn't sleep. So, uh, you know, it caught up with me after a while. Um, and part of that was just not taking the time to eat well and just pushing the stress button continually and not observing those things that are just common sense would tell you you can't do. 
Um, in fact, craziness, back in the 80s and 90s, they were even questioning the value of sleep. You know, why do we really need to sleep? You know, can we squeeze it down to three or four hours? And Mike's like, yeah, yeah, I can try to do that. And I could when I was in my 30s. But by the end of my 40s, it caught up with me. And doctors didn't know what was going on. You know, they checked my thyroid, went on thyroid medication, did all these things. Um, Finally, a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. Later, I found that I was carrying some of the microbes that um, were associated with Lyme disease, but the, you know, didn't have a specific tick bite. Um, I got a lot of ticks when I was younger, so I just you know made the assumption that they, the microbes had been dormant in my system, and it turns out that's exactly what happens to a lot of people. But it's not just things you get from ticks, you get them from everywhere. And my health crashed and conventional medicine wasn't helping me, antibiotics weren't helping me. So just by default, um, I turned to herbs and started getting my life back. And it was about a you know three to five year ordeal getting my health back completely. But I was in really bad shape. I was having severe joint issues, severe heart issues, severe brain issues. And uh, it was not a pleasant ride, um, but it all got better just taking the herbs. And of course I supported that with better health habits. I gave up the OB call, I changed my medical practice. I, you know, I, I, I did all the things that you need to do, but the herbs were the things that just made a huge difference. So I've spent the past uh, 15 years of my life and career figuring out why that happened. What were the herbs doing that made such a remarkable difference in my life? Yeah, And that's where I am now, you know, age 65 and my health is great and I'm doing everything I don't want to do. You know, I'm kite surfing and all of it. Um, and I look to the herbs and I've been taking them continually for 15 years. Yep. Um, one of my best friends, dads reminds me a lot of you, um, just in how you look and how you speak. And I know that he's been taking herbs for a long time. And so as I was reading your book, I'm like, oh, this is, this might be one of his keys. Um, and so I think that we need to start at the beginning for people to have, um, a greater appreciation who might be poo-pooing the herb conversation and the phytochemicals. Will you just talk about what microbes are? Let's start there and explain why it's important that we know that we all have microbes in our body right now already. Okay. All right. Yeah. It's kind of a triangle between talking about cells and health at the cellular level and microbes and what the herbs do. And that was where I departed from traditional herbalism. You know, I started studied traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, uh, traditional European, North American herbal medicine. So I looked at all of those disciplines, but so many of those things predated science. And there's value there, but it was observational. You know, you have these symptom complex, so we're going to give you these herbs to help with that. Um, but I kept asking my, that, that question, why? What were the herbs doing? What was going on in my body? Why was I getting better was important. And so just digging into the scientific literature and applying logic to figuring out, you know, what was going on here. And um, eventually took it down to the cellular level, which was when it really started making sense. So just just to, to, to set the stage, you know, we think about our body as a whole. And when we get symptoms, we have symptoms, right? Why? So we, we all know that symptoms don't feel good and they're different symptoms. You know, you can have pain in your leg, you can have a headache, you can have blurry vision. All of these things are symptoms. But I came to appreciate that what it was, what symptoms always are, are a manifestation of cellular stress. So when 
cells are being stressed. They release chemicals that activate nerves that tell the brain that something is going wrong. So we perceive that thing, but you also lose that function. Like if you step wrong on your ankle, you feel the pain, but you don't, you can't walk on it as well. You know, that those cells are damaged. So what healing is, is the ability of cells to repair themselves and regenerate new cells. If you injure your ankle and you walk on crutches for several weeks, things heal. What healing is, is that cellular repair going on. So no matter what symptom you have, if the symptom resolves, it's because, and most of the time it does, because our body has this wonderful ability to heal itself, the symptoms get better because the cells are repairing. What chronic illness is, is when stresses are ongoing and cells don't have the ability to heal. So in my case, those years of not sleeping, you know, cells repair during when the cells need downtime to repair. And that's hap what happens at, at night when we sleep is intense cellular repair. So I was shortcutting that. And so all the cells in my body were breaking down because I wasn't getting the, the, the right repair going on. Um, so my symptoms became chronic and it wasn't just one symptom, everything in my body started breaking down. And we compartmentalize in conventional medicine. You know, we've got a pulmonologist to take care of the lungs and cardiologist to take care of the heart and neurologist to take care of the neurological system. But the, when you look at the things, it's, it's generally when people have chronic illness, everything's breaking down for sure. Mm -hmm. So getting to the source of that, you know, you ask that question, what kinds of things are stressing the cells? You know, what are the stress factors? And, you know, I broke it down into five categories. Um, food. You know, if you're eating bad food, your food, your cells aren't nourished. You talk a lot about that. Um, detoxification, which we're going to get to a lot, is the if you have toxic substances coming in your body, that's that is uh, accumulating inside cells and and inhibiting functions. Uh, mental stress, not sleeping, and just pushing that stress button all the time. Physical stress factors, you know, physical injuries, trauma. Um, but being sedentary isn't so good either. And then the thing you started with, and it took me a long time to get to, the microbes. And Lyme disease clued me in that it's, it's a lot more complicated than just getting a tick bite and getting a microbe, that we pick up things. So there's, there's emerging evidence that this microbiome in our gut isn't just in our gut, that microbes trickle across into the bloodstream and they trickle ac across from the skin and through our sinuses. So any way that microbes, and here we're talking about bacteria, viruses, protozoa, and certain kinds of fungi. Microscopic, uh, generally one cell organisms are smaller, viruses aren't even a cell. And they are a lot smaller than our cells, like a, a hundred to a thousand times smaller. Um, but these things infect us and, you know, what they're wanting is food and our cells are food, um, basically. So they inf infect us trying to get at a nutrient source, which is our tissues, our blood. Um, and they're trying to create an environment that uh, is favorable for micro growth inside our body. If our cells are strong and our immune system is strong, they don't get very far. But what, what the science is showing is that microbes, if you're healthy and your cells are healthy, they become dormant in your tissues. They become dormant inside your cells. So your cells keep right on working, but you've got a dormant bacteria or a dormant virus in there, in your brain. We actually have a microbiome of the brain. We have microbes, a microbiome of the bloodstream of, of all of our tissues that appear have these small quantities of cells that have microbes in them. So you don't sleep, eat bad food, stay chronically stressed or injure yourself. 
in a way that weakened cells in these microbes emerge and start breaking down cells. And I'm finding that that is the key to understanding all of chronic illness, not just Lyme disease, Parkinson's, autoimmune disease, cardiovascular disease. There's a microbe component in virtually everything. And the, the science is, is out there, man. It's, it's uh, really interesting to see. Yeah. And you do write about the connection in your book, which I appreciated between all of those different types of conditions or diseases and the microbes. So if that was a new term for people, I just really wanted to get clear on what are we talking about here? When we're talking about microbes, it's the bacteria, it's the virus, um, it's the fungi, and then the protozoa. So very, very small things that we can contract throughout our lifetime that if you are healthy, and especially if you're younger, when your cells are just naturally more resilient and your immune system is more robust, they sleep, they stay dormant. They don't cause an issue, but then if we're stressed out, um, in whatever capacity they can wake up and they can say, this is our opportunity to grow the cell, the immune systems down, like let's take over. So what are some of those manifestations maybe of the most common microbe related conditions where people, I think you mentioned fibromyalgia was one. What are some of the other most common symptoms that might trigger you or another trained clinician in this area that, Hey, this could be, um, this could be a microbe issue here. Let's do some more testing. Yeah. You know, I think the knee jerk there is to think about an invasion or a new infection of a bacteria. So here we're talking about chron the chronic presence of things, not just in our gut, not just on our skin, but in our deeper tissues and in a dormant state, which is pretty fascinating. Um, so there's a lot we don't know. And, you know, we, when we look at the pathogens that we're aware of and things that are potential pathogens that we're aware of, bacteria or other microbes that can cause illness, um, it's, we're just scratching the surface of what we know. And my theory is that different illnesses occur because people pick up different microbes through their lifetime and different microbes have preference for different cells in the body. So they can cause different kinds of illnesses. And a lot of these things are pretty low grade pathogens. You know, if you hear, we're not talking about something that makes people acutely and severely ill. A lot of times people pick these things up and they're not even aware of them. Well, they cross over from the gut or the skin and they're not even aware of them. Yep. So your symptoms arose though. So what symptoms were you having that made you dig deeper into this area? I think all my symptoms had uh, connections to microbes, you know, and, and we're seeing that more and more, um, you know, definitely joint symptoms. And you know, there's a long history of uh, arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis being associated with the presence of certain bacteria. Borrelia that causes Lyme disease is just one. There's several species of mycoplasma um, and others. Uh, heart symptoms have been associated with a variety of different bacteria, but also viruses like cytomegalovirus. Brain symptoms, I think, is so it's not, you know, just I, I think all of the symptoms, again, you can trace to cellular stress and the type of symptom is related to, to the type of cells being stressed. So symptoms can be from cellular weakness or cellular stress directly from cells being stressed, but also from this, you know, if you've got chronic stress, this weakening cells in general, then you start having reactivation of microbes. And I think this is going to be more and more the model of illness that we're looking at over the next several decades. Again, we're at pretty early stages of this. You know, um, the problem is that it's going to change how we think about chronic illness and how we treat chronic illness completely. Absolutely. I think that's a great segue because I was going to ask, is there a drug for this? Is there a prescription to help with these microbes? Like yeah, yeah, the ones that you were having. Yeah, no, and obviously not. And, 
you know, the, the, the logic there is faulty. Um, I will say up front, there is a place for every pharmaceutical made. And I think that, uh, you know, I'm not anti-medicine by any means, um, but I look at them as tools. So what we're using pharmaceuticals to do is block a particular manifestation of illness. So we are affecting a specific enzyme receptor or some communication pathway in the body to, uh, to change the function of how cells are working together such that the symptom is alleviated or the, the progress of the illness has slowed. Um, and that can be really, really important, especially early stages of illness. But what it doesn't do is affect any cellular stress factors. And so people don't get well. They have to take the drug for a lifetime and they, you know, their symptoms gradually do overcome the drugs and they get worse because you haven't removed the, fa the factors that are causing the cellular stress in the first place. As far as antibiotics, antibiotics are very targeted and very specific. So they uh, kill um, exposed microbes, extracellular microbes that are outside cells, extracellular. You know, so if you've got an acute pneumonia, you know, you've got bacteria that are invading and uh, trying to enter the lungs, enter the body through the pathway of the lungs. So it's a high consolidation of really fast growing bacteria and antibiotics are the right thing. But when you're talking about dormant microbes in cells or microbes that have low activity, um, yeah, the problem with antibiotics is you kill off all the bacteria in your gut which actually increases the flow of pathogens from the gut into the bloodstream. That was proven by a 2015 study. And so it's just not a good option for chronic kinds of illnesses. Mm -hmm. That was a big takeaway that I had from the book was, and I kind of knew this, but I thought that you worded it really well, was that if you want to get well, obviously you have to heal the cell and medications don't do that. Medications cannot heal the cell. They're kind of a band-aid for the symptoms. So how does that differ from herbs? How do medications and herbs differ? Yeah, it's really interesting. The two do merge at some point because a lot of drugs are actually derived from uh, plants, but it's not the plants that we would define as medicinal herbs. So yeah, just looking at how the herbs worked, I just dug into that question of why, you know, what was going on here? Well, plants are multicellular organisms, just like we are. They are made of cells. They have to take care of their cells and protect their cells from free radicals and toxic substances and radiation and, of course, microbes. So the difference in an herb and a drug is what you're getting is the plant's defense systems. And I think this, is, this was a real eye-opener to start really understanding what was going on here. So the herbs are actually affecting cellular stress. And, and this means that herbs actually promote healing where drugs don't, which is uh, fascinating. Um, but so the herbs are protecting the plant's cells from microbes, from free radicals, from all of these. So it, it's a chemical system. It's been said that plants are the most sophisticated chemists on earth. They solve problems with chemistry. So they are neutralizing the threats that are threatening their cells. They're also using chemicals to communicate. Um, you know, so a multicellular organism, all of those cells in the organism have to communicate. So that is uh, done by chemical messaging pathways. So when we take an herb, we're getting all of those chemical messengers plus all these defense mechanisms, hundreds of chemicals that affect uh, bacteria, viruses, protozoa in a wide variety of ways. So it's working very differently than an antibiotic. So when we take in that herb, we're getting this robust defense system, not a drug that does one thing. And it protects our cells 
it adds protection, so it promotes healing because it's reducing all known stress factors that can stress our cells. Um, the chemical messengers, though, can do other things too. So if uh, like uh, a lot of plants produce melatonin that helps us sleep, they, so plants use a lot of the same chemical messengers that we do. So when you take an herb from a healthy plant, it has a balancing effect, you know, it, it, it helps normalize our stress hormones. So we, so in different herbs from different habitats, solving problems in different ways have slightly different spectrums of chemistry. So when you combine herbs, you get this wonderful uh, synergy uh, that helps all the, the herbs work together individually. I think that's good. I wanted to clarify one point. So we talk about herbs and to me, I want to classify like, what's the category? Is it the herbs that contain the phytochemicals, right? Are those, those chemical messengers that you're talking about or the phytochemicals? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. I just wanted to be sure, but are there phytochemicals that are found in plants or animals that are not herbs? Um, but, but well, sure, it, it's uh, all plants. You know, here we're talking about all plants okay. have uh, defense systems. So and animals do too, but we use, you know, similar chemical messengers, but we have a cellular immune system where plants have a chemical defense system against microbes. Um, so it, uh, yeah, so, it, so the, the plant chemistry really helps work, uh, help, helps, help, helps us out quite a lot. Um, but when you look at different plants, um, and you know, I, when we look at our food plants compared to what we define as herbs, we're not seeing that chemistry anymore. And it's because we have cultivated our food plants to produce basically calories, you know, more and more carbohydrate and or fat. Um, so we've groomed our plants in a very controlled environment that we want to reduce stress. Um, we don't want to stress the plant because we want it to produce food. And over thousands of generations, we've cultivated our plants to have more robust calories. You know, you just don't find the calories in plants in, in the wild that you do in cultivated plants. I mean, you compare a uh, blackberry that's cultivated is about five times the size of a wild blackberry. Um, and that's to get a lot more carbohydrate, sugar, whatever from the plant. Um, but in that controlled environment and the way that we have cultivated plants, the plants don't need that perfect protective chemistry. And in fact, they, uh, they just basically put it aside to and to try to uh, produce a lot more calories. And that's one of the reasons why we have to use so much more herbicide and pesticide in our food plants because they can't protect themselves anymore. They're not putting out natural protection. Mm. So when you look at herbs, you're talking about wild plants or plants in their wild state. They haven't been cultivated to produce calories and they're not being grown to produce calories. So it's, uh, we actually want to stress those plants a bit because we want them to produce robust quantities of this phytochemistry that's so important that we can gain health benefits from. So all of your herbs would still be in their wild state. Um, not a great source of calories. You know, if you had to depend on eating herbs for, uh, for your food supply, you wouldn't last very long. So it's, um, but our food plants don't have uh, all those protective chemicals or not as much. Not to say you shouldn't eat your broccoli and celery and everything else, because there's a lot of good stuff in there. And our culinary herbs have strong protective properties, basil, oregano, thyme, but those are plants that are still in their wild state. Mm -hmm. I think one really important distinction that I got from your book was that, you know, there are the essential nutrients or we'll just call them nutrients of macronutrients and micronutrients. And, and these phytochemicals that we're talking about, is that okay? If I use that term phytochemicals as the overarching yep. category, because 
Those are the things you can get from plants and herbs and animals contain, contain a little bit, but the most concentrated, powerful source of phytochemicals are wild grown herbs. Um, that's a separate category. That's not an essential nutrient. And I thought that was such a, an important point. So can you speak to how these phytochemicals aren't really essential for functioning, but they're very protective. They're kind of like the body armor or your insurance policy. You said that too. You know, these, all these questions came out by just, uh, talking to people and asking me questions, myself questions over and over again. I define as nutrient, you know, when you look at, take everything down to the cellular level, what a nutrient is, is something that a cell requires to function. Either that might be a carbohydrate or fat or an amino acid um, for uh, for, uh, generating energy, building proteins or cofactors like vitamins and minerals that cells, but it's all for cellular function. So your your cells are basically microscopic machines and they need uh, a fuel source and they, and unlike most machines, they can repair themselves. So they need, uh, they need raw materials to build new parts and they need raw materials to make whatever they make. You know, it's uh, thyroid cells make thyroid hormone, muscle cells contract muscles. So they they need the raw materials for that. So those are nutrients. So again, uh, herbs, when you take an herb, it's not a good source of nutrients. I call them non-nutritive. The phytochemicals are purely protective, purely protective. And it's fascinating way to think about it is that, you know, if your cells are stressed, they're having to churn out a lot of nutrients and burn a lot of energy. So if we take this phytochemicals from the herbs and protect ourselves from stress so our cells are less stressed, we decrease the nutrient demands on the cell. So that's a fascinating way of of, uh, looking at how the herbs can actually decrease your requirements for certain kinds of essential nutrients. Yeah. I thought that was interesting. And I'm not sure if you can actually have a deficiency in something that's not a nutrient, but I thought you brought up a, a, an interesting point in the book that you thought, I don't think we have a micronutrient deficiency deficiency as much as we have a phytochemical deficiency. And I thought that was a really interesting perspective on it as well. Well, for 200,000 plus years, humans ate forage food, which was basically wild plants. And it was very low in calories, but very, very high in these protective phytochemicals. And we started giving that up when we started farming about 10,000 years ago, but nothing like we've done in the past hundred years. I see it. My husband's a farmer, so I I can't knock him too much, but I see it all over the place then. Um, And I think that man, you know, I read the book metabolical. Uh, have you read that one? It's oh, really no. interesting by Dr. Robert Lustig. And it just goes back again to his main point that it's not what's in the food. It's what's been done to the food. And it's like, no. yes, there are phytochemicals and all of these berries. However, they're also genetically engineered to produce as, as many calories and, uh, as much sugar as possible in the fruit. So Anywho, that was just another random point that I wanted to, to highlight before we move on to this next phase of the conversation, which is, you know, who should be taking herbs? I love how you, um, point out in your book, really clear guidelines on when to take caution for taking herbs. So I think that we should talk about that next, like who should be taking herbs and maybe who should consult their physician prior to starting some sort of herbal regimen. Yeah. Um, One of the reasons I wrote the book is just to turn people on to the idea that we're all missing this and we all need to take certain herbs. So there are certain herbs that I define as daily herbs or everyday herbs um, that can be taken on a daily basis that are mainly protective, are mainly balancing, and they don't really have any drug-like effects. Now, as I said, you know, there's a lot of drugs that uh, come from most drugs that come from a plant source 
So you can move toward drug, the herbs that do have drug-like properties. Um, so St. John's wort would be something like that, that you would take for a specific purpose, depression. And it works kind of like uh, a lot of the drugs used for that purpose. Um, but here we're talking, I'm, I'm talking about herbs that really don't have drug-like properties. They have a good safety profile right along with food. So you could take those on an everyday basis and they're not going to hurt you and you're going to get high benefit from them. Um, there are actually very few contraindications um, that most people can take them. Um, I think it's probably a good idea to, to, to uh, talk to your healthcare provider about the herbs, but unfortunately, most healthcare providers that are conventionally trained know so little about herbs that they, are, they can't give very good advice. So sometimes I think it's better just to talk to an herbalist. Yeah. Um, but there are, are herbs, uh, turmeric, you know, that is in curry in India. You know, it's uh, people in India eat an average of a gram of turmeric every day in their in their curries, and it has been associated with a very low rate of cancer and Alzheimer's disease in India, despite the fact that they've got overcrowding, a lot of pollution and all kinds of other problems. So that's that's one nice herb. Um, another one I, I like is rhodiola uh, that's from Siberia that really helps us adapt to physical and mental stress. And I take that one every day. Um, Rishi mushroom is another one um, that is really good for protecting cells and enhancing immune system functions. And all of these herbs have base level antimicrobial properties that help suppress pathogens in our system, which is really great. Um, there are others. Uh, one that I'll mention is milk thistle. You know, we started this conversation talking about detoxification. So a milk thistle, I think, is one that everybody ought to take. Yeah. Okay. Well, I wrote down rhodiola in the front of your book. I was taking notes. I'm like, okay, I think I'll start with rhodiola. But then I was like, yeah, maybe milk thistle too. Um, and just while I'm on this, con while I'm on this topic, you said ewg.org is a good resource for like figuring out if products are clean or like, I don't ewg.org. Do you want to speak about that a little bit? Environmental working group. They're excellent for defining foods and products like sunscreens and things like that, uh, right, yeah. health and chemicals. Um, they, every year they put out a list of foods that should be, uh, you should really only consume those in an organic form because there's high use of pesticides and then others that you, you really don't have to have organic. So they're a good resource. They, they really don't have very much about herbal products though. Okay. Um, they're good for a lot of things, but not as much the herbs. Um, the herbal industry is... That is one of the problems is, is it's not well regulated. It's not properly regulated by the FDA. Um, yeah. Even so, you know, you hear about people that die of drug overdoses every day. And I found a source that defined drugs as the fourth leading cause of death in the country, properly prescri prescription drugs. And you really don't hear about herb disasters very often. So even though the industry is not as clean as I would like it to be, it's far from being dangerous um, and certainly not, not as much so as other kinds of industries. But uh, one thing we do in our company is just extra testing and that sort of thing to make sure that people are getting very safe products. Okay. Um, one thing I just wanted to highlight was a couple things in your book that you said in case people were wondering on like, should I take a herb or should I run this by your, the physician? As you said that a lot of them had a blood thinning effect, which I thought was interesting. So if you're already taking a blood thinner and then you start taking some of these herbs, that might be an issue. And then if you're immunocompromised, for example, after a, um, an organ transplant, um, that can be a situation where you might want to run it by an herbalist or your uh, primary care physician. But those were the two concrete ones that I remember from reading your book. Um, those I kind are of, the two big ones. Yeah, you okay. got them. Um, okay. So most everybody else 
you're probably pretty good. Um, yeah. You're on a list of 10 medications, you tread lightly there. But for most people who are not on a lot of medications, who aren't on blood thinners or uh, potentially anti-seizure medications or really heavy drugs, um, have had an organ transplant and are on drugs for that, um, those, those are the big ones that, that people have to use some caution. Okay. Um, and I want, I'm glad that we saved some time at the end of this conversation for the, the detoxification and liver health part of the conversation, but just so everyone knows like this book is really well written and he just touched on a few of his favorite everyday herbs, but he really goes into why he recommends them and, um, what dosage he recommends them and all these different health conditions too. So if you're interested in like learning more about this or getting the specific recommendations for the dosage, definitely check the book out. It's a really excellent resource there. Um, so let's talk about detoxification. You talked about mi milk thistle as a liver support, but where does detoxification really start? Yeah. You know, when people talk about detoxification, they talk about, um, they generally talk about the liver and the liver is important, but it's really important to know well, what are toxins doing and where are they in the body? And they're basically inside cells, um, inside fatty tissue, especially uh, cell membranes inside the cell. And the damage they do is they inhibit cellular functions. So there are chemicals um, there and there are chemicals that have abnormal effects, that they either block an enzyme or they block some process. So the effect of toxic substances is at the cellular level. And we're getting a lot more toxic substances than we ever have. And that is because we've been using petroleum and coal for uh, well over a hundred years now. Um, coal, you know, you, you hear about mercury in people and it's from coal. Um, you know, coal, petroleum and, and coal are plant matter that was compressed in the earth uh, millions of years ago. And those chemicals, so, you know, if you took the, the plant goo that was um, several million years ago, that was going to become petroleum or out in the ocean, the algae goo, um, it actually be good for you. But what happened is over millions of years, those chemicals, those organic chemicals that were once natural chemicals were compressed and torn into to forms that aren't compatible with life anymore. Mm -hmm. So that when we're burning those, making plastics and doing all these things uh, that we use petroleum and coal for to produce energy, those substances are released in the atmosphere and they're not compatible with life. So they basically, these, these distorted organic molecules uh, inhibit uh, the organic molecules inside of our cells. So it's at the cellular level. So your cells, healthy cells, are constantly purging these substances. But if your cells are stressed, because you're eating bad food and loading your cells up with toxins and you're not getting exercise. So the most important part of exercise is moving blood. When you get out and exercise, you move blood, you dilate your blood vessels, and that forces more fluid around your cells and washes away debris and buildup of toxic substances. So the first step in detoxification is moving blood. So we do a lot with exercise. And for folks that can't exercise, I recommend infrared sauna because it moves blood and dilates blood vessels. So that starts the detoxification process. So cells start purging this stuff. We start pulling this stuff out of the cells. It goes into the bloodstream and the lymph system. And finally, it makes its way to the liver. So in the liver, these mainly fat soluble substances are neutralized into water soluble substances, but they have to be bound in bile and then carried out to the GI tract. Um, and if you're not getting a lot of fiber, they can be reabsorbed or not, you know, there's nothing to hold on to. So, fiber, digested fiber from eating lots of plants is the best thing that you can get to hold on to those toxins and pull them 
out of your body. But your liver cells take a beating, truly they do. And over time, you replace your liver cells with non-functional fat cells as you burn out your liver cells from this excessive amount of toxin processing we do. And it's called fatty liver. So 25% of the American population has been found to have fatty liver, significant number of cells of liver cells replaced with fat cells. So that's really bad because if you lose liver cells, you can't process the toxins. They just stay in your body and other things happen. You can't process blood sugar quite as well. Your blood sugar starts going up and you can't process cholesterol. You can't get rid of that cholesterol in your blood and your cholesterol starts going up. So this toxic liver is the, is the root of all of it. So taking care of your liver is really important. A lot of herbs do that. They protect liver cells, um, but some herbs, milk thistle being one of them, dandelion, yes, the kind that it grows in your yard, um, it are, have phytochemicals that protect liver cells to the degree that the liver cells can actually start regenerating. And that's the cool thing about a lot of different cell types in our body is we can make new liver cells. So very interestingly, uh, when I was practicing, I did a lot of laparoscopies. Uh, that's a, a surgery where you look inside the abdomen and I always looked at people's liver. And you look at somebody in their 20s and they had a nice beefy red liver. By age 40, 50, 60, that liver was starting to turn a mottled yellow cover in color. So it's, um, yeah, it's a big issue. I think, so let me ask you this. I know there's stages of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And so we know that at least I've been taught the earlier stages of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease are reversible, meaning you can kind of get rid of the fat cells and replace them with healthy liver cells. Yep. But what about the later stages of the disease? You know, I never say never. I mean, uh, you know, people can get to the point and you've got to remember that there's probably a microbe factor here too. We know, we know a lot of viruses and bacteria and other things attack liver, especially if cells have been weakened there. So there's a probably an unrecognized uh, a viral uh, or microbial factor that is beyond the recognized uh, hepatitis uh, viruses um, that's going on here when the cells really get weak, uh, because again, the liver is a big target. But um, yeah, the... I, but I never say never, and I've just seen such remarkable things with the herbs, and the penalty for using herbs is so low, it's kind of like, why not? Why would you not do that? Um, so, you know, eating smartly, eating more vegetables, getting more exercise, trying to clean, keep your air and water and food clean so you're reducing your toxin load, all of these things are remarkably important, but um, taking milk to you know, and I've been taking milk thistle now for oh, about 15 or 20 years every day, every yeah. day. And uh, my cholesterol last year was lower than when I was in my early forties. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the liver detox, because I think that that's a really kind of buzzword right now is detoxing the liver. And you've already explained how true detoxification starts at the cellular level and it requires blood flow to kind of compress the cells. Is it kind of like squeezing the toxins out of the cell? Well, no, the, the cells actually have uh, mechanisms for expelling these abnormal chemicals. I mean, our cells are very complex machines. Um, you can think about it as a little microscopic machine that is self-contained. And so cells even though all of our cells function together and uh, make us a unit, they function independently. So they are constantly purging toxins, uh, rebuilding and replacing parts that wear out, replacing mitochondria that get burned out. So our cells are, have a lot of function. So yeah, the toxins, different toxins are going to be expelled from the cells in different ways. But, um, but yeah, you know, that, so, but if the, but the cells have to be healthy 
and that 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 space around the cells has to be clear so they can push this stuff away and get rid of it. So when people do a liver detox, um, what does that even mean? Like, what would you recommend for someone? Or is that just kind of a hot topic? That's not a real thing. I'm curious. You know, people do that. And I think they feel better to do something intensely for five days or 10 days. Um, Personally, I don't do them. I look at detoxification as an ongoing process that really needs to be happening continually throughout your life. And so my lifestyle is a detoxification lifestyle. It's not something that I do a 10 day version of it every three months. I'm doing it every day because Mm -hmm. my cells are constantly, I mean, face it, you know, we're bombarded with more toxic substances than ever before in human history right now. We're getting it in our air, we're getting it in our water, we're getting it in our food. And even if you live cleanly, you're still getting some of it. Yeah. And these are all things that were not present in the atmosphere of Earth before uh, to 100 years ago. And coal, maybe, but yeah, coal has been used for maybe 3,000 years, but not heavily, except for in the very recent past couple of hundred years. So these things weren't there. They didn't exist. Your ancient ancestors were not exposed to these things in any capacity. We're getting bombarded with them. So, you know, waiting and doing something once or twice a year, ah, you need to do it every day. Right. So that milk thistle, what are some of the other ones that you've mentioned here or in the book, um, some herbs for liver support? Unfortunately, there are a lot of them. Turmeric, yeah. reishi, rhodiola, berberine dandelion, andrographis. I mean, the list just goes on and on. And that's a really cool thing is that so many of our herbs are actually protective of cells throughout the body, but including liver cells. Yeah. So the really cool thing with an herb is we tend to take things for a specific symptom, but the herbs are affecting all cells in the body. So that was a big puzzle in the beginning. You know, when I was first learning about herbs, I was used to, well, you take this drug for this symptom or this illness. And then you look back at the history and you found that an herb, um, maybe cat's claw was used for brain health and arthritis and, uh, you know, and respiratory infections. And you're going, wait, wait a minute. How's it happening? You know, it, how's it doing all this stuff? And then you study how these phytochemicals are protecting cells. They're not protecting a cell type. They're protecting everything. And you might find an herb that, um, like milk thistle, that does milk th- uh, that that does uh, liver cells more specifically. Um, but it's still protecting everything else. So you're getting some eye protection and everything. Yeah. Well, I think that this has been a really interesting interview. Was there anything else that you wanted to be sure? Um, I think one more thing I wanted to hit on was I'm all for the natural remedies whenever possible. I would include this in the natural remedy. I feel like this is the protective layer, but we also want to reduce what we're protecting ourselves from. So let's get really clear on what things are toxic and damaging to the liver. Let's answer that question and then we'll wrap it up. Well, you know, it's when you look at cellular health, the, the, there are five categories of factors that enter into the equation. So nutrition, what you eat, and certainly there are lots of foods that either enhance liver health and cellular health in general, or, or reduce that. So a high processed food diet is going to really have a higher potential to load your cells up with the wrong kinds of foods, but also toxic substances. Um, toxic toxins is the second category. Again, we're, you know, we're, we're exposed to so many different things. And it's as simple as just trying to live in a space with clean air, filter your water, eating clean food. Um, right. Uh, third category is stress, emotional stress. If you're not sleeping, your cells aren't regenerating, and that's liver cells too. So average America sleeps six and a half hours a night. That's not enough. You need eight and you need good sleep. Um, So staying up and watching uh, some uh, stimulating television show till 11 o'clock at night, you're just not going to sleep well. And you have to have that regeneration. It's really important. 
physical factors, exercise, moving blood. And then, you know, again, we're just scratching the surface of the micro factor and how much that plays into absolutely everything. And I think into many forms of liver disease. Yeah. So I think that my big, the biggest takeaway there is like, we talk about alcohol. We talked about, we talk about fructose specifically for the liver a lot, you know, but Dr. Rawls has clearly explained, like, if you're not sleeping, you're hurting your liver. If you're not exercising regularly, you're not facilitating that detoxification process. Um, if you're stressed, my goodness, I talk about stress on here so much because I think that people, especially women, um, they're just, I don't know if it was like how we were raised or what culture teaches us that we have to do it all, that we have to be everything to everyone and that we have to wear all these hats. And, you know, we place such high expectations on ourselves. Um, and if we don't take self-care and stress management really seriously, it has really detrimental health effects. So I used to, I literally used to say in high school, oh, it's okay. I'll sleep when I'll, when I'm dead. And I don't say that anymore. <laughs> like I am going to get my sleep. So, um, I hope that people today learned a lot about the, the power of phytochemicals and, and herbs and, um, kind of the differences between herbs and drugs and how that we, how we can protect our liver. Were there any other major takeaways that you wanted people to have from today's interview? Uh, I think that I hit all of them. You know, my message is just trying to turn people on to this remarkable value that we just have discounted and placed on the shelf. And, you know, it, it's time to bring it back and people should be paying attention to this. But I like looking at it from a Western science point of view, and the science is solid at this point that these things are remarkably valuable. Yep. I have one more question um, that I almost forgot to ask. How can you tell a quality um, herbal supplement from a poor quality? So let's end on that where people are like, okay, I'm ready to go get some rhodiola like I am. How do I find the good stuff? You know, I, I think it's finding trusted companies is the biggest thing. Uh, every website you get on, everybody's going to make claims of quality, purity, and potency. And, you know, it's, um, again, I think there are very few products out there that are truly dangerous, but I, there's a lot of junk that you're just not going to get full benefit from. So getting to know the company, um, it's like at our company, uh, we test every uh, every herb, every extract that we use on multiple levels um, through the entire manufacturing process to make sure that we are getting something that is pure is the is the herb that that is actually on the bottle and then is a, is a super high quality product. But um, you're going to generally pay a little bit more for a better quality product. You know, it, it's uh, cheap products. They're skipping all the testing. And a lot of companies are doing that to hold the price down. But you just, you, you can't know unless you do the testing. Cool. Okay. And you have some other tips in the book on like the more that's on the label, the better. So if it just says rhodiola and then the dose, it's probably not a good one, but if it has more detail by it, that's a good sign. Yep. Yep. Okay. Cool. And, and taking blends, you know, when you, I mean, it's like we combine multiple herbs because you get so much more benefit than just taking one individual herb. Okay. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate your expertise. Uh, the three years that went into sure. writing this book, my goodness, it's a great resource. Um, I've learned a lot from it already. And I feel like it's going to be one that I have to go back through and read a little bit slower to really absorb. So where can our audience learn about you? Um, the book you can learn about at, uh, the cellular wellness, cellularwellness.com. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. Please take the time to read the reviews. A lot of people have taken the time to review the book um, and we've gotten some good reviews from it. And it's uh, and also our company, vitalplan.com. Um, but I also have an alternative site for my for just other content at rawlsmd.com. Perfect. OK, well, thank you so much, Dr. Rawls. I've appreciated your time today. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, bye.